Welcome, everybody. We are going to just go ahead and dive right into week seven. Uh, we're going to be going over food safety, food adulterants, and as well as going into a little bit of foodborne illnesses. So let's go ahead and start. All right. So week seven, the final week before the second exam, we're going to be going over food safety, including uh, best practices, uh, the additives to different foods, and as well as foodborne illnesses. There's a little bit to go over, but again, hopefully I'm going to try my best to condense it down to only that important information, but definitely utilize the readings as that can be able to expound a little bit more, especially as some of your assignments and the exam is going to be going over um, many different examples and thoughts. So it's good to have a lot of different examples in your in your mind to better understand these concepts. But uh, first, we're going to be going over foodborne illnesses. And so first, uh, for this class, we're going to be going over six specific foodborne illnesses. Uh, the important thing to be able to understand, these are illnesses that are brought, aboard, brought about by some sort of microorganism found within the food itself. And so a lot of the symptoms, they're going to be almost the exact same. I've tried to highlight whenever it's a, hey, this is fairly unique to this one element, um, but they, they're, they're all almost the same. And they all are very related to each other. So be sure to try to pick up on those very um, specific differences. One of the biggest things with foodborne illness, almost of any variety, they almost always follow that fecal oral route. So basically anything having to do with feces. Yeah, we're going to be talking about feces a lot in this, uh, in this class, specifically this section. Um, how any of that gets into our mouth, into our digestive system, and it really does mayhem with our system. But the six specific ones we're going to be going over are E. coli, salmonella, trichinella, shigellosis, hepatitis A, and clostridium botulinum. And um, those pictures that are right there, they're just fun little graphics, but not, nothing really too important that you have to be able to remember for this specifically. Um, so the very first one we're going to be going over is E. coli. So E. coli, it stands for Escherichia uh, coli. Don't quote me on that, but it stands for a specific type of bacteria. This is commonly found in the intestines of cattle, chickens, deer, pigs, basically animals in all essence, even ourselves. We actually have thousands of different types of E. coli bacteria within our own intestines. However, it's actually very few strains that actually cause illness um, within, within us. Uh, it's even though it's found within animals, it's typically doesn't cause them to get sick at all. So it's just something that really kind of affects us. In addition to this is mostly coming from those animal products. Um, it can be able to contaminate milk, juices, spinach, lettuce, uh, even water. I feel in the, the most often whenever we hear about this in the news, we hear about it um, as far as contaminated spinach um, or contaminated milk with E. coli. Um, or various different meat products that get recalled because there's an over-contamination of E. coli in them. It's very prevalent. I think this one, and as well as salmonella, which we'll talk about in the future, we probably hear the most about, but um, a little bit more. So E. coli, it can be able to cause abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. Specifically, uh, E. coli actually damages the lining of the intestines, and causing bloody diarrhea to be able to occur. That's a that's a very um, kind of unique thing, but a very important thing to remember with E. coli. Typically, after you eat something that has an overabundance of E. coli bacteria in it, it takes about two to five days of an incubation period before you actually start feeling symptoms. Uh, and those symptoms could be able to last for about five to 10 days. In some individuals, this could be a fairly serious um, serious event, but for most people, it just comes and it passes. Um, the important thing is, well, like many of the um, like many of the foodborne illnesses that we're going to be going over, uh, this is gram negative anaerobic bacteria. Now, why is that important? And so, it's important just if you've taken a microbiology class or plan to. Uh, so, cool piece of information here that's good to remember. So, 
whenever we're looking at bacteria, there are a few different types and generic scopes to be able to think about. One of them is gram negative and gram positive. Ultimately, gram negative, gram positive, all that has to do with whenever we add dye onto the solution to better see and visualize the bacteria, does that dye stick or does it not? And so gram negative means that it doesn't stick. And it typically doesn't stick because gram negative bacteria possess um, a hard outer shell you can think about. It's a, it's a certain membrane. And on this membrane, it actually acts as a protective coating for the bacteria itself. This is very important because gram negative bacteria, you'll hear about it in the news a lot as now we pointed it out. Gram negative bacteria, because it has that that membrane on the outside, it actually makes it resistant to a lot of specific types of antibacterial um, materials, but then as well, I can't think of the word right now, but um, antibiotics, antibiotics, antibacterial materials, and as well as antibiotics. So it makes it very hard to get rid of this bacteria if it is present. It's also anaerobic. So um, there's two different things, aerobic, anaerobic you can think of like aerobic exercise it has to do with um, a very oxygen uh, enriching um, of your cells within your body um, a lot of oxygen kind of pumping through it's suggesting that these ones they don't need a lot of oxygen to thrive that's why they thrive very well inside of our bodies inside of our intestines there's not too much oxygen uh, just freely flowing uh, in that kind of environment but uh, that's really E. coli. Again, one of the biggest things to be able to, to remember with E. coli is that it damages the lining of the intestines, causing that bloody diarrhea. All right, next, salmonella. Again, this is possibly the second most common one that we hear about, especially it's estimated that salmonella actually causes roughly 31% of all food-related deaths, which is insane when you think about it because there's so many more beyond just this six that cause food related illness. But this is definitely a very big common one. The reason I wanted to move that is there's a picture I wanna show you, uh, but let's go ahead and talk about salmonella first. So commonly found in ingesting feces of an infected person or an animal, one of the biggest callbacks to salmonella has to do with undercooked egg products. You probably heard while you were growing up, hey, don't eat uncooked um, cookie dough. I'm not gonna tell you not to eat it because it is fantastic, but definitely salmonella is one of the biggest worries whenever it comes to uncooked, undercooked egg products or raw meal, milk or raw meat. Um, it's that worry that salmonella may be too present and in overabundance. Uh, very similar to E. coli, this also can be able to cause bloody diarrhea or joint pain. Typically, after you ingest it, uh, it takes about 6 to 72 hours to be able to come up. So it's very, very common and it's very, very quick in how it onsets of symptoms. And it typically could last uh, roughly about a week um, as far as the symptoms itself. Very similar to E. coli, it is also a gram-negative anaerobic bacteria. And so just estimated, fo or estimated food-related deaths, one of the big contributors potentially to that has to actually come from the dehydration and how quickly it comes on. Um, again, as you're suffering from diarrhea or vomiting, one of the biggest worries uh, that we have during that time is not necessarily the, the feces or the vomit itself, but how fast your body is losing water. Um, I wanted to be able to, I moved the little me um, just to be able to illustrate this picture. Uh, so down here, there's a fork going through a... Um, a salmonella bacteria, just again, kind of pointing out foodborne illness. But on the top top left, this was actually interesting. It was, um, I can't remember what state it was, but they created this little uh, children's diagram of like salmonella and be, you know, be aware and be be scared of this. And they labeled it Sa Sally Salmonella, which is cute. That's adorable. But I, I I do think it's kind of, I'm not saying it needs to have like a very mean face and like intimidating to make kids actually scared of it. But I, I don't know if this is necessarily as effective as maybe what they were going with, with making it so cute looking. So uh, just a side lesson as far as whenever you're talking about public health and 
getting messages out to people and making sure that they're interpreting messages correctly. This could be a little bit of a, of a gray area and whether or not this could be effective. My opinion, that's it. It's not going to come up on any tests. Don't worry about that. But that's really salmonella. Undercooked egg products, probably the biggest factor and in, in uniqueness um, that we see with it. Next, trichinella. So I'm going to be moving this little diagram with me in it all over the place. There's a lot of pictures I wanted to, wanted to show you guys. The staple thing with trichinella is that it comes from undercooked wild game or pork. So there's little pigs right up here in this top picture. And in this bottom right picture, you'll notice it's not a bacteria. It's actually worms. So trichinella, another very interesting, unique characteristic of it is that it actually is a parasite that causes uh, trichinella or trichinosis. And so it comes from the trichina worm that is present in wild game and pork. So if any of you hunters out there, um, whether it's deer hunting or really any sort of wild game, it could have trichinella in it and have these worms present within it. The symptoms, um, if you ingest too many of these worms, your immune system and your, uh, they don't die in your digestive system, uh, it actually, another unique feature, so is that the symptoms come in two phases. So the first phase, it usually happens one to two days after you actually ingest um, the food, is you start to experience heartburn, vomiting, diarrhea, um, basically any part of the enteral tract, which is your digestive system or your intestines. And then um, it moves on into this systemic so that's whenever the worms are now in your intestines, they now actually start moving throughout your body, kind of creepy, I know, moving throughout your body and getting into various different organs. So that's another interesting thing about trichinella is that it doesn't just affect your digestive system like all the other foodborne illnesses. It can cause your eyes to be able to swell. You start developing a, a pretty nasty cough as well as some joint pain, um, Typical onset is about two to five days whenever you start experiencing some of the really bad symptoms, and they can last all the way for about two months or eight weeks. So this is uh, this is one one of the longer uh, longer duration ones. But again, some very important key notes with trichinella: it's a parasite. It's not a bacteria or a virus. And then as well, it comes from undercooked wild game or pork. And then it also appears in two phases. The symptoms itself occur in two phases. All right, so next, shigellosis. So this is not only sounds like a cool dance move or a nightclub, but it is also a foodborne illness. So this is commonly found feces. So this could be feces, whether in food, due to improper hygiene, in daycares, and swimming pools. Honestly, this is one of the most common ones whenever it comes to infants. Shigellosis or the Shigella bacteria is naturally present even within healthy and sick individuals uh, within just our feces. Um, but it's whenever there's an overabundance of that and we ingest it, that it's not a good thing. It's no bueno. And so it's commonly found in our feces, symptoms typically then as well produce diarrhea uh, and joint pain. Uh, it can also even cause seizures in children underneath too. So it is something very serious to be able to remember and keep think, keep in our minds whenever we're dealing with infants, especially as who's the most likely culprit to be grabbing random things and sticking them in their mouth or grabbing random things after they've touched their poop? Infants. It's like a weird catch-22 that just circles itself around. Very similar to E. coli and salmonella, it's a gram-negative anaerobic bacteria. Um, the interesting thing about it, though, is that humans can actually become kind of resistant to certain strains of Shigella um, for a duration of years. So, for example, if you were exposed to, I'll just make up one, type A Shigella bacteria, you went through, you got sick, then you got better, and you recovered, and you were exposed to type A Shigella again, there's a good chance you're not actually going to display symptoms or get sick at all, but you can still kind of pass it on. If we look at this up in the top right picture, that's just another um, picture of what we interpret as Shigella, um, how it looks. It looks very similar to the other 
um, gram negative anaerobic bacteria that we're going to go over today. Um, and then in the bottom right, I thought this picture was a little bit funny. Um, it all it illustrates is there's a, a woman in the pool and it just shows that there's little poop uh, emojis all throughout the pool. Because again, one of the very common things that we see is Shigella levels increase in public pools and swimming areas. And that is largely due to children and infants being in the pools, but not having proper swimwear uh, to be in the pool itself. That's why anytime you're in a public pool, always put your, your child, if they're still potty training, put them in a swim diaper. Swim diapers, they don't hold in any sort of water, but they're intended to hold in that poop. And hopefully it can be able to limit some of this exposure to other individuals. So public health announcement, PSA, put your kids in swim diapers if you go to a public pool it's for the best, really. All right. So foodborne illness next, hepatitis A. So this one's a very simple one, but we'll go through it nonetheless. Um, commonly found contaminated food uh, and water. This one is an interesting one that it's basically solely person to person. It's not animal to person and person to person. It's, it's typically just person to person as far as how it's spread. Some of the symptoms that are unique uh, to hepatitis A is that it can be able to produce flu-like symptoms, so that vomiting, that nausea, uh, that fever, um, but as well jaundice. If you remember some of the past lessons, jaundice is the yellowing of the skin and eyes, and then as well anorexia or loss of appetite, and also just a general malaise, just feeling feeling just bad um, overall. Uh, the very interesting and unique thing about this is that it actually takes a long time before symptoms show up, typically 15 to 50 days. So it could take about a month after exposure to know that you have hepatitis A. And so it's a it's a very interesting foodborne illness whenever it comes, uh, comes to that. This one also a unique feature is that instead of being a bacteria or a, vi or a parasite, it is a virus. Um, it's the hepatitis A virus. Um, and another thing is that it typically, it really attacks the liver. That's where that jaundice kind of effect comes from. Uh, this picture right here on the right, it just illustrates a few of those symptoms that are fairly unique to it. It just shows the hepatitis A virus. It shows the human liver and that that's where it primarily is attacking, therefore causing jaundice, uh, the yellowing of the eyes. And then as well, vomiting, uh, general malaise. I think he's feeling fatigued in malaise, I guess. And um, just a very sad looking emoticon. Just he's very sad in this instance. But again, a uh, very key characteristic. It's a virus, unlike all the other ones. And the onset of symptoms or the incubation period, otherwise known, it typically takes about a month or 15 to 50 days, which none of the other ones are even close to being that long. All right, next one, Clostridium botulinum. This one you may have known, especially if you have kids, you may be more familiar with this than you realize. Uh, bot Clostridium botulinum, otherwise known as botulism, is commonly found in canned foods and also in honey. So it's naturally occurring and present within honey itself and some of the symptoms that uh, commonly uh, commonly are associated with it include slurred speech, muscle weakness, respiratory paralysis. So respiratory paralysis is a huge one specifically again it's it's causing just a delay of neurons being able to or nerves being able to to interact and and react with its environment. That as well causes a delay on muscles being able to react and function properly. So with respiratory paralysis, it's the number one um, cause of or reason for death whenever an individual is suffering from botulism. Uh, what it is is actually the various different muscles that are involved with their respiratory system. They actually get overly fatigued and your body can't properly communicate with them. And you actually aspirate. So you slowly just suffocate because you cannot breathe. Um, it also um, causes a condition otherwise known as floppy baby syndrome. 
So it sounds kind of, sounds kind of silly, but it actually is fairly serious. Um, this is where, especially if you're a parent or um, you know little kids, one of the biggest things that a lot of pediatricians advise and different organizations is that you should not give an infant honey. And that's, again, because of botulism uh, in general. It really affects babies. Um, adult bodies can typically be able to process uh, quite a bit of this, uh, of the botulinum bacteria toxin. Um, but little babies, they, they, they're not able to process it as well. And so a lot of organizations actually suggest that you should not give honey in any form to any baby underneath one. And a lot of other organizations actually further don't recommend any honey until they're well after two years old. But uh, these pictures up here, so in the top left over here, it just shows a baby that's um, head is kind of flopped down at that floppy baby syndrome that's talking about. It's that muscle fatigue. This baby actually is in recovery and it was actually doing well. They um, healed, healed well, um, but suffered from, from botulism. Um, also in the top right picture, it's just showing a lot of microbes. Not all those are the, the botulinum uh, bacteria, but it's just showing that they're all coming out of a canned food item. Because again, a key feature of this is it's from canned food, uh, improperly canned food, especially where not all the bacteria was killed before it was actually canned. And then this bottom picture, which just illustrates a baby is pulling a pacifier, but it says honey may quiet them, but botulism can kill them. So one of the big things, uh, almost almost like a wife's tale, is that in order to be able to quiet down a fussy baby, you would actually give them either a spoon or a pacifier covered in honey. And one of the reasons it's sugary, it's sweet, typically the baby likes that, so it's going to focus on it a little bit more. But as well, just if you equate that botulism can be able to, to cause a, a baby to be a lot more uh, delayed in their function. If it's being overexposed to too much honey, it could possibly is only due to that alone. But again, it was a very common practice, even whenever our parents, uh, parents were uh, kids. And it's something that largely has been slowly being stomped out. So if you didn't know, again, PSA moment, uh, avoid giving your early and young child honey just due to that botulism um, botulism risk. So again, this is a gram-negative anaerobic spore-forming bacteria. Uh, specific to this is that this bacteria produces a nerve toxin. That is what causes botulism itself. That's that nerve toxin and like how it delays the respiratory or causes respiratory paralysis. So this one is actually an interesting one on that. I tried to specify it even more. So this one is very specific whenever it comes to an anaerobic uh, spore forming bacteria. So those two characteristics are very important. So anaerobic, mostly because if you think about the environment of like a, a canned food, it's sealed. It doesn't have any oxygen coming into it. That's the perfect place. And that's the place that this bacteria wants to be, to be able to, to multiply and to grow further in the right conditions. That's why canned food is a, improperly canned food uh, is a breeding ground for botulism. Uh, in addition to that, it's spore forming. So many, many different types of bacteria, if they don't have a, a proper casing on it, sometimes they're just naturally destroyed by the elements or uh, different environmental factors. But being gram negative, it already has that membrane to protect it. But the fact that um, this bacteria is also spore forming. It's able to basically maneuver itself in a in a certain situation so that it's less susceptible to the elements. That's all I'll go into it. Uh, it's not very important. It's not on the test. I will give you a hint there. Um, that, that's not on the test at all. It's just more of a fun fact to be more aware on how serious botulism and these Clostridium botulinum um, bacteria really is. But again, key factor causes floppy baby syndrome, causes respiratory paralysis, specifically in canned food or from canned food.
All right, that's all the foodborne illnesses. So now we're going to go with a little bit into food safety. So um, food safety, these are all the different handling practices that not only you will be observing in, I believe it's the relevance um, or it's the case study assignment uh, where you go out and you're going to visit two different establishments. If you can't do that, just watch someone prepare, prepare their food and have these things in mind to then be able to write what are some good things you saw, what are some bad things you saw, some things to improve, things of that nature, and kind of readily keep these things in your mind. But they're all different things that add into um, meals that we're making and food that we're preparing. How are we preparing food and how can we do it better? This picture here on the right just shows that there's a wide variety of things that all point to ready to eat foods. And as far as cleaning materials, um, hands, uh, sanitization, raw meats, unwashed fruits and vegetables, staff clothing, complex equipment, equipment and utensils, all of these things play a factor in what the overall quality of the food is and also how likely a foodborne illness may come about from it. So it's different areas that we're going to talk about in this class include personal hygiene, cross-contamination, time and temperature, sanitization, storage, and also just general best practices. I'm not going to go over all of them. There's a wonderful resource on uh, iLearn. Use that. Uh, it's in the reading section. It talks about food safety practices. Just look through that list. It has a lot more than I'm going to illustrate. But these are some of the ones that I thought were interesting or would be good to at least know about all of these. Okay, so food safety continued. So personal hygiene, I apologize the slides aren't that fun and exciting. Mostly it's just a lot of repetition. I'll try to make it exciting with my words. So again, the first thing we're gonna look at is personal hygiene. So there's some different things to be able to look at. One of the biggest things, and a lot of these have to do with restaurants. And so, especially if you've ever worked in a food industry, whether it be fast food, an actual restaurant or service in any way, you're probably very familiar with these. And it also is important to understand that these aren't hard, fast rules. These are more general guidelines, just because that's going to vary state by state on which ones you are required to follow and which ones you don't necessarily have to. So, but I digress. Personal hygiene. So one of the biggest things is before handling food, wash your hands for 20 seconds. So then wash your hands after the bathroom or after handling any money. So if you touch anything, wash your hands before you start handling food. And then as well, keep or send sick employees home. By keep, I mean keep them home. Don't put, don't risk putting sick employees on a front line or in the food industry because it could then contaminate the food itself. Um, as well, keep your fingernails trimmed um, toenails, not very concerned with as long as you have shoes on. That's another thing. Keep put shoes on. Don't do open toe shoes, but keep your fingernails trimmed as then it's, le it's less likely that there's dirt or gunk underneath your, your fingernails. Next, you must have a sink that's all dedicated only to hand washing. So that's actually a huge one. Um, and whenever I've done a, um, a safety survey of a restaurant, I've actually found a few restaurants where the building wasn't originally generated or created as a restaurant, but they made it one. And whenever you go and survey the back, there's no one sink that's only dedicated to hand washing. And again, that's super important that you can't do anything there except hand washing. And typically that means you have to have a sign that says, this is the hand washing sink. But it's a big thing. Um, addition to that, avoid wearing jewelry while preparing food. That could be able to include like long dangling necklaces, even some earrings, or especially biggest culprit are rings. One of the biggest things, uh, even if it's a solid band ring, is most often rings do have some sort of intricate design or, or gem holders or anything like that. Those are all little crevices that bacteria could be able to get into. And if you don't properly wash your hands or if that is on there and it's not sanitized, that can easily get into the food. Next, cross-contamination. One of the biggest things, use different cutting boards for different food. I was a big culprit of this just in my own house. Um, 
just as far as I would have like one cutting board. Well, on that cutting board, I was cutting meats and I was also cutting vegetables. And that is not good just because the prevalence of bacteria on raw meat is much higher when it, than when it, when it comes to vegetables. Same thing if I am preparing raw meat and then I move it onto the stove and then I immediately start cutting vegetables, I may not cook those vegetables to the same degree that I cook that meat, but the bacteria doesn't know the difference. They don't get on board and therefore now they are on those, those raw vegetables in whatever capacity. So it's important to be able to keep that in mind. It's a good practice. Use different cutting boards for different food. Similarly, just like I spoke about, do not place cooked meat and raw meat on the same plate. So even if it's just for a second, not even once, don't mix those two together um, on a very similar situation. Make sure all meat is cooked thoroughly and stored in separate containers, uh, even if it's just a temporary use. Uh, another important thing is if you have an ice machine at work where you utilize a scoop, it's important that that scoop needs to be hung on the outside of the ice machine. Uh, you should not be storing that scoop inside of the ice machine itself. Very similar to that is if you were ever worked in the food industry, you should never scoop, use a, a glass cup to scoop up ice out of the ice machine for use. You can only imagine if you were to utilize that, you hit it a little bit too hard, you hit a rough patch of ice, the glass shatters. Well, how similar does small pieces of ice look to small pieces of glass? Don't do that. But big thing, ice scoops, don't store them inside the ice machine. Anything that gets on that scoop, if you throw it in the ice machine, is now just sitting there and letting the bacteria potentially grow and fester. Never store raw meat above vegetables. This is a very big thing whenever it comes to storing items within like a temporary fridge. Um, so if you were to store raw meat right above a, a basket of vegetables, even if they're covered, sometimes things leak through, but that's the big thing. Raw meat, especially if it's in a fridge, it's going to thaw over time. And as frozen meat thaws, it naturally gets wet and it starts leaking. And so that's a higher likelihood that it could potentially leak on those vegetables. And the very same thing with that I illustrated before. You cook meat one way, you cook vegetables another way. If no, that bacteria from the raw meat gets on the vegetables, there's no guarantee that you're going to cook them the same to be able to get rid of that bacteria. Same thing, do not touch glassware that comes into contact with food. So especially for those of you who maybe have been a waiter for any period of time or if you've ever eaten out, if you ever watched the waiter, that's a very good sign in being able to show, are they protecting against cross-contamination? How are they holding the plate when bringing it to your table? The biggest thing is that if this is your plate, they should not have their thumb on the top of the plate to hold it. It's hard to hold those plates. I get it and I understand. But that's why a lot of different restaurants, they actually have certain types of plates with lips kind of on the bottom just to make it easier to grasp from the bottom just so they, they don't have to worry about that cross-contamination factor. Continuing on, time and temperature. So there's not a lot with time and temperature. So these are very important to remember. Hint, hint. Keep food out of the danger zone. And by that, I'm not talking about Top Gun. Uh, with Tom Cruise, you know, Goose and Maverick, Danger Zone. I'm talking about the degrees in Fahrenheit from 40 to 140. This is referred to as the Danger Zone. It's referred to as the Danger Zone because this is the area where most traditional bacteria and viruses like to grow. It's between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why most fridges, if you have a... Um, a, an actual numerical sensor on it that tells you how cold it is. Typically they sit at about 38 degrees, but something that's less than 40 degrees, but a little bit higher than 32. Uh, again, this is degrees Fahrenheit. For those um, of you more familiar with Celsius, I'm sorry, I don't really know those conversions very easily. It's something I'm working on, I apologize. But at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, water freezes. And so you want to keep a refrigerator above that. 
But at 40 degrees, most bacteria can readily be able to multiply a lot easier. So you need to keep it underneath 40. So it's also an important, it illustrates a very important um, principle. Underneath 40 degrees, bacteria slows multiplica multiplication with it. So you could go all the way down to the negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It does not kill the bacteria. It just slows the process for it. Um, I believe that with most of these, if you go tremendously low, again, it just suspends how fast they multiply. But if you go above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that's where you're actively killing the, the bacteria and the viruses itself. It depends on the bacteria and the virus, but above 140, you're typically good. So again, stay out of the danger zone, 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. As well, make sure that you're always properly thawing meats. My mom growing up, horrible at this. Not to rat her out, because I also do this, but these are very important to be able to um, utilize because we all thaw meat and making sure that we do it correctly. So in a refrigerator, thaw meat in a refrigerator. So again, it was zero degrees. Now it's going to be 38 degrees. It's going to slowly thaw, um, but it requires that preparation, that time. Try to think ahead. Um, but again, I'm really guilty of that. I'm really, it's really hard on that. Um, a slightly faster way to do that is that you actually take the frozen meat and you put it in cold water. Um, I've seen conflicting reports on this, but I personally feel that if you do this method and you put it in cold water to be able to thaw it out, you need to have at least a, a drip or a constant running water on it to circulate that cold water so that it doesn't heat up to regular room temperature. Again, regular room temperature could be about 70 or 80 degrees. That is within the danger zone. Bacteria can start multiplying, and especially if you just let it sit there for a while. That could be pretty significant. That's why one of the biggest things to be able to really be aware of is whenever you're looking at this, and I forgot to write it down in there, I will put a note in this, is making sure that how many how many hours can something be within the danger zone before you um, have to throw it away? And that's at a max of two hours. So within that two hours, if you have some meat that's been thawed out and has been sitting in the danger zone for two hours, you need to immediately cook it or you need to throw it away. That's been about too long. And so that bacteria may have multiplied too much. That's why, again, if you're really in a pinch, actually using the thaw feature on a microwave can be very convenient. So next is sanitization. So restaurants must have a three sink compartment. And so with that, it's important that there's three, three functions. Again, if you've worked in the food industry, you've seen these. It's a wash compartment a rinse compartment, and a sanitization compartment. Um, it, it's just a very, very specific feature that is almost in every single state plan whenever it comes to food safety. Next, wash washcloths daily. So throw them in the laundry, recirculate them, get new washcloths um, whenever you need them to avoid that potential cross-contamination even further, but it's a sanitization issue specifically. Also, wash cutting boards before and after handling food. No matter what kind of food it is, before and after you use a um, cutting board, wash it. As well, garbage in the back, especially, again, fast food restaurants or anything like that, you generate a lot of trash naturally. Those garbage, garbage cans should be covered. That way, you can be able to limit not only in um, the potential of food leaving or falling out of it, but as well, the potential for bugs or various different pests and being able to be prevalent in the back of the restaurant itself. Also, no bueno. Hand wash sinks are only for hand washing. So again, that hand wash, hand sink washing factor. All right, um, last one dealing with food safety, storage. All food needs to be at least six inches off of the floor. This not only can be able to help um, prevent against if something is leaking or dripping, you can be able to clean underneath it easily, 
but it's going to help kind of regulate that temperature, make sure things aren't thawing or freezing as um, that they shouldn't. And also it is able to help keep pests away from potentially getting to that stored food. Um, additional to it, food must be covered, especially anytime that it's stored, it must be covered in some sort of container and covered around it. Same thing, open food must be labeled and dated. When was it opened? That way you know within five days, you use it or you throw it out. That, um, just as you open up containers of food, it's that clock starts ticking on when that bacteria starts growing. And so as well, it's utilizing a first in, first out. Honestly, again, worked in fast food, worked in the food industry at all. You probably have nightmares with FIFO, with first in, first out. So if you um, get an order of something on Monday and then you get another order of it on Thursday, use the Monday stuff first before Thursday. Because typically, the Monday stuff is going to expire before the Thursday stuff does. All right. Never store cleaning chemicals near food. This one should be self-explanatory. But it's, again, you don't want that interaction between those that storage materials. Same thing, store cups upside down to be able to prevent any sort of uh, contamination and to keep it sanitary for the customer. And then as well, store utensils handle side up. And that's as well, just because as you are handing out this, these utensils or even the cups itself, you're touching a, a usable side. You're not touching the, the eating or drinking side. Um, some general best practices. This one is referred to as miscellaneous in the reading, but I think best practices make the most sense. Always sharpen your knives. A dull knife slips more often. And so utilizing a sharp knife will allow you to be able to better focus and actually be accurate in your work. Same thing, turn pot handles inwards, especially if you're at home. Um, you, if your kids are like my kids, they try to grab everything that they can see, but they don't know what it is. Turn those pot handles forward. It could save you a lot, especially, heaven forbid, boiling water or anything like that. I don't even want to discuss it or talk about it. Um, hold knives pointing down is a big one. Just if you were to, to, heaven forbid, slit while holding a knife, it's more likely that that knife is going to just go straight to the ground rather than up in the air and potentially anywhere else. Uh, same thing if you accidentally run into someone, it's pointed down, it's not pointed out and potentially could stick somebody. Um, another big thing, huge, if a knife falls, let it fall. I am very guilty. I'll just be like drinking something. And if I drop it, I, for some reason, try to catch it with my foot. I know I'm not alone there. Whenever it comes to a knife, no, get out of the way. Let it fall. It is a sharp object. Don't try to catch it. You cannot hacky sack this knife up and you should not. Next, use the best knife for the best, for the job. And so whenever it comes to cutting tomatoes, you don't want to use a cleaver. You don't. It's not the best knife for it. You want a serrated edge. It's able to cut through the, the skin of the tomato and actually produce a good result. Uh, same thing. If it's bread, use a bread knife. Um, use the best knife for the food that you're going to be interacting with. And then as well, this one's a big one that I just remember. It's not even in the reading, I don't think. But I just remember, do not throw knives in a full sink of water, especially in a soapy sink of water. I had to yell at coworkers all the time. And you can probably imagine why. Um, I reach in to try to grab a dish so that I can start washing dishes. And lo and behold, there's a ton of knives right there under the water. I can't see it all. Not a good idea. And so as well, huge thing at home. You might know that there's a knife there, but someone else coming along doing the dishes they may not know. So it's best to stay safe out there. All right. So that's all it comes to best food safety practices. Again, utilize the reading materials. It goes into a lot more. And it's important to be familiar with those because I can guarantee there are some on the test. So adulterants. So this one is kind of a little bit um, mixed together, adulterants and contaminants. But they're very, very similar. Uh, so an adulterant is something that's mixed in 
intentionally or not, um, that takes away from the quality or the safety of the item itself. Um, so again, adulterant, and there's also contaminant. Contaminant is typically that unintentional, that unintentional aspect of it. Whereas adulterant typically is intentional. They put it in there on purpose. Um, but both of these things take away from the quality of the food itself. I'll make sure to write a note about that um, whenever I post this, that that is an important distinction. Adulterant, contaminant, I apologize, it's not on there. But for those of you who are watching and listening to it, I appreciate you. Okay. This could be able to include not only foods, but cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, fuels, many more. This is everywhere, adulterants and contaminants, all the, all over the place. And so before we go into the China gutter oil scandal, you possibly have heard about this. It's disgusting. I want to talk about some common culprits um, that have to do with adulterants and contaminants. So adulterants, again, intentionally putting in something to take away the quality of it. Some of those things include water into juices, foods, and drinks. Just be able to water it down, thus taking away the quality. It's possible as well, your parent may have been guilty of this um, growing up. My mom would do that with apple juice just to make it last a little bit longer. But another example of that is brick dust into cocoa powder. Um, they would actually put brick dust in it because it was something that we couldn't, we don't necessarily taste it, but it can be able to expand how much powder there is. And so um, I, it's not cool. I don't think it's cool, but it is a common practice that some of these, uh, some of these groups do. Um, but then we can go into the contaminants portion. So again, taking away quality, but this one's typically unintentional. Um, so common foods and insect animal parts. If you are very squeamish or you really, really like food, you may wanna fast forward like three minutes or so. But because this may rock your world if you've never heard about it before. But every single food item, there is an allowable limit whenever it comes to insects, insect parts and rodent hair, rodent feces, rodent parts with associated with every single food. This may gross you out, but don't worry, I'm going to wrap it up really nicely, which is going to be great. But I wanted to spend some time on this because I think this is so dang interesting. 100 grams of peanut butter has an allowable limit of 30 insect parts and one rodent hair. That means that within, they'll take a sample size of 100, of 100 grams of peanut butter. They smear it on a, um, basically you can think of like uh, with a microscope, that uh, little piece of glass that they shine over a light. That's very similar to what they do. They take peanut butter, they smear it onto that glass, and then they count how many insect parts, how many rodent hairs, how many rodent feces, rodent parts are within that to be able to see, is this batch of peanut butter good or bad? And the FDA has said that if there's 30 or less insect parts and one, only one rodent hair, it's good. It's good to go. So that's disgusting. So let's keep going. One fourth cup of cornmeal that can be able to have up to one whole insect and two rodent hairs and 50 insect fragments and one fragment of rodent dung and still be okay. Still be okay. One fourth cup of cornmeal, 100 grams of chocolate. If you love chocolate, I am sorry. Shy away. Fast forward two seconds. 60 insect pieces, and it's okay. One pound of coffee beans. You may or may not drink coffee. I don't know. I don't drink coffee. But one pound of coffee beans, 10 milligrams of animal poop, and 4 to 6% of beans can be insect infested or moldy, and it's fine. And again, remember, these aren't or. These are and. They can be able to have this and this and still be okay. 14 ounces of tomato juice, four maggots, and 20 fruit fly eggs. Still fine. 10 grams of crushed oregano. So spices, that's not safe either. Well, it's safe. I'm, I'm not trying to scare you or anything like that. This is, again, just more of a fun fact thing. Um, 10 grams of crushed oregano, 300 insect bits, and two rodent hairs. 
again, I'm bad whenever it comes to grams and kilograms and like converting it over. I believe 10 grams, that's a teaspoon. That's insane. But again, the biggest thing whenever it comes to this, and the FDA says this as well, is that a lot of these, it's more of a, a yuck factor. It's more of a that's disgusting rather than a risk factor itself. These parts and these elements, they typically do not lead to a foodborne illness. They don't. So you should be okay whenever it comes to these. It's just making sure to just be aware. There are contaminants in it all the time. The FDA has said it is unreasonable to say that we produce any sort of food that doesn't have these contaminants in it. If you're mass producing food, they naturally are in it. And it's just an acceptable risk that we have. And hey, if you didn't know of any of these, you didn't notice until now, but now you do. So sorry about that. But that's adulterants. Now let's go back to this, the China gutter oil scandal. So this is an actually a very interesting one. There was a news report back in 2013 that illustrated some of the um, different areas within some of the bigger cities within China uh, underneath the restaurants, because they were typically gathered and clumped together in, in specific geographical locations, is there was a whole fiasco going on where oil from these restaurants were being dumped down into the sewer drains. Well, in the sewer itself, that oil was then being collected by a company, uh, like, again, sewage mixed with this oil, it was then refined again, bottled, and then sold to more restaurants, typically smaller chain restaurants and uh, smaller like family owned, like very, very small establishments or street vendors. But it was a recognized thing. And it's actually something that the Chinese government is still tackling today is this interaction where they're selling gutter oil and sewage oil for cooking and, and preparing their food. So again, just, I wanted to ruin your night. Hopefully you're not eating anything. Um, and if you are, I'm sorry, but uh, just some interesting things. Those are adulterants and contaminants. Again, I will make that distinction. All right, next let's talk about additives. So additives are different than adulterants and contaminants. Additives they're mixing of stuff in this, mixing of substances, but they are meant to increase the quality of the food itself, whether that be they make it last longer or anything like that. And I guarantee you're very familiar with these, even if you didn't know of adulterant at all in the first place. Some very common examples of these include iodine and salt. So salt typically doesn't have iodine in it. But iodine is a uh, natural substance that we need uh, for our natural processes. We just don't get it from very many things. So the powers that be, and especially the FDA, actually, well, the FDA is more just the U.S., but many different countries around the world, it's not just specific to the U.S., actually throws iodine into salt just because it's a very commonly used added, added to many different kinds of foods. Very similar, vitamin A, vitamins A and D added into milk. These are vitamins that we need um, during a certain period of time. It was actually found that we were deficient in these vitamins very often. And now, whenever we think of milk, we commonly associate it with vitamin D. It's like, if we're drinking milk, that's where we're getting our vitamin D. Um, so drinking milk, going out into the sun, um, those are, that's another common additive. Uh, that's thrown in to boost that quality and make it better for us. As well, niacin and bread. We need niacin. They throw it in the bread typically. That way we can be able to get that daily dose of it. Same thing, folic acid in grain products. So this, again, if you didn't know, this is going to be a great um, opportunity for those of you who have um, are thinking of having kids here in the future. Folic acid is huge to the development of a fetus especially in those very early, um, uh, the very beginning of the first trimester, just the, the development of the fetus itself needs folic acid or folate. Um, with that, the at least the U.S. government better recognized that 
how important folic acid is during this time, especially this is a time that some women don't even know that they're pregnant and they need this. So one element is that many things are enriched grains. So different cereals or bread actually has injected in or added in folic acid to be able to help just this case alone. And it's, it was almost a united effort to just help tackle that critical time period that's needed for uh, pregnant individuals. Also, it's understanding that not everything is actually good, or sometimes it's added for a quality other than the actual benefit of a human, sometimes to add the added benefit of the product itself. An example of that artificial sweeteners, it tastes really good. Um, and there are some things that do show that some artificial sweeteners like um, high fructose corn syrup, they could be good or bad for human health. Same thing like Splenda or fructose or sucralose or um, any any of those like artificial sweeteners, They whether they're good or bad for your health, those are an additive just because they give the perception that they are good for you or that they reduce something in a, a, a good quality manner. Same thing, antioxidants. If you see anything that boasts that has antioxidants, typically those are additives uh, put into it so that it actually keeps it from spoiling. Um, so there, antioxidants are not only something that is debatable on whether it's good or not for, the, for humans in general and our general practice, but it is good for products because it does keep from um, items from spoiling. Same thing, monosodium glutamate, otherwise known as MSG. Um, this is very, uh, you, you always hear it, it's usually tied to um, like Asian food. However, this is something to be able to increase the quality, increase the flavor, a flavor enhancer in a way, but it's an additive and also artificial food coloring. So this is like red dye number five, blue number two, lake seven, those things. And more recent research has actually come out to be seen an association between that those artificial colors and um, having to do with uh, actually the development of some cancers. However, um, those artificial colors uh, have been shown to be able to, to just help out with the actual uh, preservation of the food itself. So again, not everything that increases quality necessarily is good for us, but it does increase the quality. And then also sodium nitrate. If you really like hot dogs, I hate to break it to you, a lot of nitrates and nitrites, they're added into that to be able to help preserve and make the, the meat look better. However, they're actually not that good. They can actually, um, there's been some strong correlations between nitrites and diabetes, um, as well as anytime you go to the store and any of them in the meat section, typically it's a huge culprit of this, Anytime that the meat just looks like like they just barely uh, put it right there on the platter. I doubt it. It's probably been sitting there for about a day or so. And meat, if you've ever actually prepared raw meat, it typically goes brown. It just as it loses that blood look, but it looks better red. Nitrites are typically added to it because it keeps that red look. Um, although it doesn't really do any sort of favors to us. But it's an additive. It increases the quality of the product, even though maybe it doesn't actually increase the safety to us. But um, kind of confusing, but definitely just be familiar in that an additive is something that increases that quality of the product, where an adulterant or a contaminant is something that decreases that quality. And then last but not least, HACCP. So I'm not going to go into this too much. Uh, to be honest, there's not really much about this whenever it comes to assignments, hint, hint. but um, it is important to be able to understand what it stands for. Uh, HAACP stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. It stands for, it. basically it's used for a process to maintain food safety through analyzing situations and controlling uh, variables. So as you go through an HAACP, it's a seven-step process. You'll learn about it more in your reading. Seven-step process to be able to look at a different environment or a different situation and look for vulnerabilities or things that you can improve. So again, uh, that picture right there just illustrates this a little bit much more. It illustrates H is for hazard. So that's danger to our health. 
A is for analysis, investigation of the hazard. C is for critical, so crucial for containment. C is, oh, the other C is for control, handling all the conditions. And then P is for points, which is the position in the process, kind of tracking, making sure that you're going through those seven steps, you're looking through it. Again, not gonna go through uh, it too much. The reading goes into it a lot better. I think that would be a better resource for everybody, but at least associate H-A-C-C-P stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. But that's really it. Um, that's really the end of the slide. Um, for the weekly review, definitely make sure to, to look at this, review the readings, and get ready for the exam that's coming up. It's going to be a big one, but I know that you can do it. If you have any questions or would like some additional information, feel free to reach out. You guys are the best. And yeah, let me know. Bye.